In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today I'm going to begin speaking to you a bit about something that I don't actually have great familiarity over, but something that I think is very relevant for us and on time. Somebody a couple days ago gave me this little booklet on St. Jose Luis Sanchez del Rio, the Cristero boy martyr, one of the very young uh, people that was killed in the 1920s in the wake of the Mexican Revolution of Freemasonry and Communism and the great persecution that swept through Mexico. And so I'm going to spend probably a few sermons actually just going through some of the background of what happened in Mexico and particularly what happened with, with this child martyr. I think it's, a, it's an incredible story and, and again uh, in very many ways relevant to perhaps what we're facing at our own time. You know, when it comes to the troubles in Mexico in the 1920s, there's a few things I think to be mindful of. One is that they were actually not that long ago. So, just in the 1920s, they're technically within living memory. I don't think anybody here right now was alive then, but we do have parishioners that were alive in the 1920s. We still have a handful. Um, also, the I think we're facing some of the same forces, both Freemasonry and Communism, in our own country. And those forces tend to work in similar ways throughout history. So it's, I think, useful to familiarize ourselves with some of these historical events. I've been encouraging people, for example, to read the Gulag Archipelago by Solzhenitsyn, the great Russian author of the 20th century who experienced, I think, even decades in the Gulag prison system of communist Russia. And these things, I think, are becoming more and more relevant and more and more useful to us. Um, but also when it comes particularly to the troubles in Mexico, the fraternity does have a providential relation to them. Actually, one of these came to me last night, but, but another one occurred to me this morning. In the first place, our seminary in Denton, Nebraska, so just outside of Lincoln, Nebraska, has the relics of many of the priest martyrs. And they came to us in a very unusual way. So these priest martyrs mostly of Guadalajara. I'm told if you go to the seminary in Guadalajara, which has many, many hundreds of seminarians, that between the main building and the chapel, there's a grand hallway. And in the hallway, there are all these skeletal remains of priests who in one way or another gave their life during the 1920s in Mexico. If you've ever seen that movie for great glory, I think it actually uh, you know, gives some theatrical uh, testimony to the deaths of some of these great priests. So as these seminarians walk from studies or walk from the refectory or whatever it might be to chapel to pray, they have to pass through the ranks of these Kind of skeletal witnesses to the faith. It's really incredible. <clears throat> Every seminary should have something like that. Well, when we were getting ready about two decades ago, almost, no, that's not true, about 10 or 12 years ago, to consecrate the chapel, something happened where we, we just didn't have the relics that we needed. You know, every altar that you consecrate has to have several relics of the saints in the altar, um, and particularly of martyrs. And I'm not sure what happened if something fell through, but we ended up short. You know, there's about, I think, eight, you know, there's eight altars in that chapel so that all those priests could say mass every single day. And so we needed quite a bit, of, quite a few relics. Well, one of the priests that was in Guadalajara at the time was familiar with this seminary. And he went to them and begged that we might share the relics, and they consented. And so the priest was able to actually go in and chip away some of the bones from eight of the priest martyrs from the seminary in Guadalajara, and then transport them up uh, to the United States, to Denton, Nebraska, and to rebury them in the, the various altars that were being consecrated at the great dedication of that chapel. So if you go now to the seminary in Denton, Nebraska, each of the 
chapels, each of the altars next to it somewhere will have the portrait of a priest, a priest martyr of Mexico. So that's, I think, a very strong connection, actually, to these things that happen in Mexico. The other thing is that, as you know, there's several female religious orders that have some connection to the fraternity. There's the Benedictines that we find in Missouri, um, but there are also the Carmelites that are now in various places throughout the United States, but their mother house, if you could speak like that, uh, is in Lincoln, Nebraska, and that's actually just about 10 or 15, maybe 20 minute drive from our seminary. The seminarians every single Sunday go up to that convent in order to uh, assist with the Holy Mass, with the Sung Mass. And many of those convents have been flooded with young women from fraternity apostolates. Well, that convent too, its origin was actually going far back enough, was Mexico. And the original Carmelites that founded uh, a new convent in San Francisco, and then from there uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska, I'm skipping a few steps, but suffice to say, San Francisco to Lincoln, Nebraska, they ended up in San Francisco because they were fleeing Mexico in the 1920s because priests and religious were just being murdered left and right. So we have these kind of connections to what happened in Mexico. And I think people that go to fraternity chapels, they should have a mind, not only because of the times that we're going through, but because of the many great and noble martyrs and people that suffered and died and gave great witness to their faith in Mexico. Again, within living memory and very, very close to us here in the United States. Okay, so those are some of the kind of maybe connections that we might have uh, to things that have happened in Mexico. Um, but now I want to give you a little bit of the background to particularly what happened in the 1920s in Mexico. So you know that there was a revolution in Mexico and that that revolution was always very hostile to the church as Freemasonry always is, as communism always is. However, in the immediate wake of the revolution, according to this pamphlet, the persecutions on Catholics were very spotty throughout Mexico. So it was kind of in this region or that, but where local government met stiff resistance by faithful Catholics, they it became kind of lax in the persecution. And this was prolonged until in 1924, Calles pres became president of Mexico. C-A-L-L-E-S, President Calles. And Calles instituted in 1926 a full persecution through several decrees that became known, known as Calles Law and the military and civil leaders of Mexico uh, were compelled by this law to much more aggressively uh, persecute the church. And it was the intention of Caius to utterly stamp the church out of existence in the country of Mexico. And he did this in many, many different ways. You know, one of the ways that I didn't know actually until I read this, but which is strikingly similar to something that happened in France and in other places, is that Caius apparently created a constitutional church, a schismatic church, to which priests were encouraged to join, you know, to throw off, quote unquote, the shackles of Rome and to take on the shackles of Caius. Yeah. And this happened, of course, in France as well. You had um, what were called the juring priests, the priests that had taken the oath of the constitutional government and had rejected Rome and rejected the Roman Catholic Church. And I think here, not only Mexico, but France is remarkable to us or should be known to us, the response of the people to these so-called constitutional churches, which was utter rejection. In France, particularly in southern France, in a region called the Vendée, um, the rejection could not have been stronger 
of these constitutional clergy. And I think if history repeats itself, and perhaps once again here or in other places in the world, we find these constitutional churches arrayed against us, we need to take on the same sentiments of the French and Mexican people in totally rejecting them. In other words, we cannot be so desperate ever for the sacraments that we're willing to receive them from profane hands, from hands that have been raised up to strike Holy Mother the Church. And these priests in the Vendée were treated with almost amusing contempt. So there's a famous story, for example, of one priest, one constitutional, a juring priest who entered into his church, the French government, like the Mexican government, stole all the churches from the Catholic people. So he entered into, quote unquote, his church. And two of the faithful and pious old women in this village in the Vendée followed him in, which was maybe remarkable in itself because most people wanted nothing to do with these juring priests. And in fact, very often they would find their churches completely empty even when they said mass because people refused to be present for their sacrilegious masses. So this priest, this fallen priest, walked into his church and two elderly women followed him in. But they didn't follow him alone. They brought with them a bucket and soapy water and a sponge and everywhere he walked and set foot in that church, they followed behind him and desperately scrubbed the floor. <laughs> and that's the kind of sentiments that we need to steel ourselves with should such a constitutional church become a reality again. So this happened in Mexico in the 1920s, but of course there were great persecutions as well. Priests were being hung from their own rafters. They were being shot by Republican soldiers in the streets. Uh, they were being driven out of the country and the faith was just about everywhere and in every way conceivably being suppressed and thrown down. And then this very unusual thing happened, something that we're not really familiar with anymore. It just doesn't happen. It's still technically on the books, I think, in canon law as a possibility. But it's been, I mean, literally, I think, approaching 100 years since it's ever been used. And the character of the church right now is just such that it's almost unthinkable that it ever would be used. But in 1926, after these decrees by President Calles, the bishops of Mexico, the faithful bishops of Mexico, gathered together and they put the entire country under interdict. They put the entire country under interdict, which seems almost totally backwards to us that during a time of the beginning of an extremely harsh persecution, that the bishops suppressed the sacraments. In other words, in Mexico, you, you could not lawfully get the sacraments outside of perhaps if you were dying. And why? Why did they do this? It's so strange to us. How could they do it? It almost seems unjust. But the reason for them doing it was not because of this Republican, communist, Freemason government. The reason for it was because the people were complacent and comfortable with that government and complacent and comfortable with the suppression of the church. And the bishops realized that unless the people were stirred to action, that they would soon lose everything. And this was a final wake up call to them. And it was a very effective wake-up call, actually, because immediately Catholics began to organize economic movements of resistance, which persisted for quite a long time, various boycotts and other ways of expressing their discontent with the attacks and persecution on their faith. And eventually, in 1927, the Christeros movement itself, again, which is detailed in that movie, For Greater Glory, which probably recommend that if you haven't seen the watch, it's very, I think, inspiring and um, very heroic movie. 
that would be, I think, good for your faith, probably, uh, to watch. So, this is what happened in Mexico. And here again we have this kind of striking similarity, not, of course, in that the bishops have um, issued an interdict over the church, and certainly not because they've issued an interdict over the church to wake us up from complacency. But there has been a kind of interdict in the church over the last 10 or 11 months coming on now. And although it was not perhaps the bishops trying to do something that was spiritually beneficial to their people, I think providentially that this very much was an interdict from heaven and was part of the chastisement of our time. And chastisements, we know, are not purely punitive, although they are punitive. Right? They are an expression of outrage from heaven. But they're not purely punitive because God is a good father and disciplines his children. And when we've grown lukewarm, when we've grown complacent, when we've begun to, or perhaps for many years or even decades, taken the Mass and taken the Holy Eucharist and taken Holy Confession and taken all of these sacraments, which now I think many of us hold so dear, taken all of them for granted for far too long, then our Lord responds appropriately by taking them away from us for a time. And I think for many of us, that period in 2020 where the sacraments were very difficult or even impossible to find were a wake-up call from us, from heaven, that we do need to treasure these gifts that are left to us and left to the church, and that particularly in our own time, we need to treasure them because we know not how long they are going to be freely available to us. And so we need to wake up. We need to be aware and we need to desperately cling now to the sacraments as means of arriving at a holiness which will fit and suit us for whatever times may be coming. May God bless you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.